this area, which is the cradle of civilization, is today being dragged down in the, in the most disgusting bloodbath and, and decay and the most, you know, the complete decomposition of, 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 of human uh, relationships. Uh, if you look at the bourgeois media, what, what is, uh, what is the, the idea that you get? Basically, the idea is put forward that this is something, you know, suddenly that happened. You know, suddenly a group of well-armed men uh, staged an uprising in Mosul and the whole Iraqi army collapsed and melted away and the Iraqi state uh, split up in, in, in three as if it came out of nowhere. And I think this really shows the, the complete lack of the of ability of the, of the bourgeoisie to understand the situation and the complete blindness they have to, uh, the complete decay and dead end which, which they have actually reached historically. Uh, for Marxists, we view the situation in, in a different way. Uh, as, as dialectical materialists, we have a long view of history. We understand that, that in fact, Development uh, in history, uh, as well as in nature, is not something that takes place gradually, step by step, but in fact that underlying currents can, can you know, quantitatively rising contradictions over a period of time will always reflect themselves in a violent rupture with, with the state. And that is the situation. The, the situation that we, see, that we see today unfolding rapidly in the Middle East, with you know, not even one week being similar to the week before, is, uh, well obviously never is, but, but, but the complete change of the situation from one, one week to another is not the result of this or that arbitrary group or name or, or, or anything else, but in fact the result of decades of plundering, of, of raping, of violation of, of the whole of the region by imperialism and, and by, the, by the capitalist system uh, in, in, in fact. Um, however, I would say that if we only look at, again, if we look at this situation in isolation, if we look at the, you know, uh, this uh, ISIS or Islamic State or whatever the, you, know, you, you want to call it, uh, and, and we look only at this situation in, 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 in some parts of Syria and, and Iraq, uh, we can get quite uh, pessimistic uh, conclusions. And also I don't think we would, we would understand the reality that's taking place, what really, really need to really need to take a look at is what is the real situation in the Middle East and what has been the main developments over the past uh, period. And I would say for decades, uh, ever since the Middle East was dragged into, basically dragged into capitalism by the imperialists, mainly because of its natural uh, resources, the, the Middle East has been a place where a tiny minority connected to imperialism, connected to, to, to the main you know, oil industries and so on, has had an extremely lavish and luxurious life, whereas the vast majority of the population have been living in the, in the worst, uh, you know, in, in the worst situation: poverty, unemployment, wars, you know, uh, and, and the most uh, and the most suffocating oppression. In fact, I would say the, the worst thing about living in the Middle East is not necessarily that, that you have to fight every day to stay alive, but it's the fact that you cannot <laughs> breathe. Because there's, there's no freedom to breathe, you cannot express yourself, you cannot do what you want to do, there's no future uh, to, to look forward to, and there's nothing progressive to build. And that, that, and that is the main driving force, I would say, uh, b behind the developments that we, see, that we see today in the region. And the first reaction to that was not ISIS, was not, was not the situation that's taking place now, but what, in my opinion was the Arab Spring, which started in Tunisia, you know, because there, there was this, uh, beginning with the, uh, this Bouazizi, you know, who, who burned himself, although he wasn't the first person to burn himself in Tunisia. Before that, there were dozens of people who had done the same thing throughout the, the region. But that was a, the last straw, we, 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 we can say. And there was an explosion, social explosion, <coughs> beginning with the youth, uh, rebelling against these ills, which are essentially the, the ills of capitalism. Maybe the people there were not, were not ready, for, you know, were not, were not uh, conscious about this, and, uh, and, and obviously there were no communist agitators or socialist agitators, really clever people to, to brainwash them. This is, uh, as, as people always uh, claim, you know, that revolutions, uh, the bourgeois always claim that revolutions are the creations of, 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 of communist agitators. There was none of that. But instinctively, these people, these young people, rebelled against the, 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 the oppression the, the, and the decay that capitalism uh, really means. And this uh, basically swept through the whole, uh, the whole region. In fact, 
you know, uh, often we hear about, uh, especially in these uh, fine uh, places that they call universities, very clever people always tell us about the strength of the state and the strength of the military machinery and the media propaganda and so on. But the fact was that without any plan, any arms, any organization, any leadership, the masses of Tunisia, within a, uh, within a matter of a few weeks, overthrew the Ben Ali dictatorship, which had been there for 30 years. And immediately afterwards, afterwards, within a few weeks, you had the downfall of the Egyptian state, which is not just any state, but, but it was the second largest ben beneficiary of uh, U.S. military aid. This enormous uh, state apparatus, hundreds of thousands of spies and you know, intelligence uh, officers who would entrench all areas, all pores of society, basically, could not stand up to the unarmed uh, will of the masses. Once they, had, once they had decided to overthrow, um, not, not to overthrow the regime, but once they decided that they would not live another day in this situation. And that tells us something about the strength of the revolutionary movement, uh, that, that once it's on the move, nothing can, uh, nothing can, uh, can stop it. Um, da -da -da -da. Yes. Uh, now, at the same time, within these uh, these revolutions, I would say there was there was more than just uh, just uh, you know there's more to it than just a movement in, in, in Tahrir Square. In fact, what we saw, which is something that uh, that again there's a myth portraying that uh, that uh, the Middle East is uh, is just you know everything in the Middle East is about religion, is about Islam, is about you know basically I mean the way that it's painted is that oh the Middle Eastern people are basically just people who want to live in a middle, medieval society with no rights, you know, they, they're against modernity, modern society, whatever that means. Uh, and, uh, and religion is uh, the, after, you know, the overarching, uh, you know, the, the all-encompassing factor above all this. And this is something that they began especially to, um, to put forward uh, after, the, after the collapse of the uh, of the, uh, of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, where, where this guy, Samuel Huntington, put forward his uh, idea of the clash of civilizations, that this was a new driving force of history, basically, in a, you know, in a, very, in a slightly disguised way, putting forward a racist idea, that, that from now on, history would move forward uh, between the clash of civilizations, between mainly Western society <coughs> and the Eastern society, and in their, you know, Islamic society being, being one of the main uh, things. However, I would say that the, that the Arab Revolution disproved this completely. Because what we saw uh, during the Arab Revolution was, on the, on the one hand, you had the Arab dictators, who were uh, Muslims, you know, at least in words, uh, of, of all kinds. And hand in hand with the American imperialism, with Western imperialism, with European imperialism, uh, all the so-called democratic leaders of Europe and the U.S., uh, with Barack Obama, also one of them, because he was completely mum throughout the whole thing, basically uh, supporting these dictators uh, uh, and being completely hypocritical uh, with, you know, about the so-called democracy that they always uh, call for. And also in Israel, we saw that Netanyahu was completely behind, was, was, was very afraid of the fall of any of these dictatorships, which for him was a, was a sign of stability, some people that he, he could deal with. That was on the one hand, you had the ruling classes basically of all the world, and on the other hand you had, within the, within the Arab world, you had the, the masses of the Arab world, whether they were Muslim or Christian or, or anything else. In fact, I mean, you could see that in, uh, in Tahrir Square you all saw the scenes where Muslims were praying and then the Christians were, were uh, having, making a chain around them to de defend them against uh, thugs and, and lumpen elements. Uh, and at this, not only this, but you had at the same time millions of people in the West. I remember, I mean, I'm not an, uh, I'm not an Arab, I'm, I'm an Iranian, so you know, it's a bit different than the, than the rest of the Middle East. But I was watching Al Jazeera day and night. And so all my friends, people who had not been political ever before, was following the, the situation minute by minute. Uh, and cheering, basically cheering on the, on the revolution, on the revolutionary movement of, of the Arab um, <coughs> And that shows, you know, that, that in, the, in the final analysis, and when once uh, society enters a crisis, the, the, the most important thing is the question of class. 
the question of which interests in the economy do you represent? Do you represent the, the, the rich, the elite, the oppressors, or do you represent the, the, the workers and the youth, the dispossessed and, 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 and the oppressed? Um, at the same time, we also saw that the immense movement of the working class, in fact, in Tunisia, it was, uh, it was the movement of the... Uh, in Tunisia, it was the movement of the workers, of the, of the developing general strike in different regions that overthrew the Ben Ali uh, dictatorship, which happened in the last days of the revolution. Uh, and in Egypt as well, the, actually the revolution had, had stalled at one point, and it was only once the working class started coming in with the developing general strike that the, that the army generals, basically, and the ruling class, that we cannot uh, afford this, and we need to ch uh, take down the Mubarak in order not to, not to change the regime, but in order to prevent the collapse of the whole of, of Egyptian capitalism, in, in, in effect. Um, so that shows also the strength of the working class. Once it begins to move, that they can pull the whole, all of society to a, uh, to a, to a halt. Um, but I would say the most important development during the revolution was the question of, uh, of power which was posed in more ways than, than one. In fact, we saw everywhere throughout, in all countries where there was mass movements, we saw councils, uh, you know, people's uh, assemblies, and different institutions uh, basically being developed by the, by the revolutionary masses themselves in the factories, in the neighborhoods, in the areas, in the regions, where normal people, uh, you know, like yourselves or, or your parents and so on, would develop and in, in would participate in, in the running of, of, of society. Uh, I, I would say probably in Tunisia this was the most developed. In several regions, the councils voted to take power altogether until there was a new government. But the, but but they were present everywhere also in the in, in the Egyptian revolution. And the, and and the significance of this is this that the that the state that is there today is the, is a is a capitalist state, is a bourgeois state, essentially developed. To, to subjugate the majority of the people and, uh, to, and, and to allow them to be exploited by, by the bourgeoisie, allow, them, allow profit to be extracted from, from the work, essentially. However, these uh, councils were, were, were like, we could call them the embryos of what could have been future workers' state. This could have been uh, institutions through which the, the revolutionary masses could assert power themselves. But I would say that the main problem, uh, problem was that uh, in spite of all of this happening without any theory or you know knowledge, you know prior knowledge or plan by the masses, you know, which shows the enormous strength of the movement, the, 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 there was not there was not enough, and the masses did not realize that in order to to what, what needed to be done was to take power themselves. They didn't realize that the es essential problem, you know, all the things that they were fighting against, unemployment, poverty. Uh, uh, you know, the lack of democracy and you know, all these, these things were you know, uh, completely tied up to the capitalist system. And the way to overcome this was to take power themselves through their own councils, connect them on a national scale and take power, and also to take economic power, which is the most important source of power in, in, in society. So, so to nationalize uh, the, 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 the industry and the, you know, the main banks which are there, and which are still controlled by the same people who ruled the countries uh, before. So de facto, they, you know, although they removed the heads of state, they removed you know, the head of the dragon, the body still re uh, remained, and, and, and no matter who would come up uh, to replace that, um, this, the, the main uh, levers of power were still in the hands of, of the ruling class. And that was a shortcoming of the revolution, that it did not have a leadership <coughs> That was that was uh, that, that was that realized what needed to be done. Like go, you know, take the revolution to the, to its uh, logical uh, conclusion, and thus they pass power back to one or another uh, part of the ruling class. In Egypt, first it was Tantawi, who was a general, who was you know from the same family we can say as as Mubarak. Although he was pushed out by mass movements, which developed immediately afterwards. Then you had the, the, the rise of power of, of Morsi, and, uh, and, every, and you know, immediately afterwards we saw again, oh, there we go, you see, this is what they always wanted, and this is what the Arabs wanted. But Morsi didn't, uh, didn't represent uh, anything, but again, another layer of the, 
another part of the Egyptian bourgeoisie who had been pushed out and isolated for a period. And in fact, the role that the Muslim Brotherhood had always played, which was the reason why they were allowed to exist, in fact, because they were tolerated for decades. And, and especially the last 20 years, the 15 years of the Mubarak dictatorship, was, they were uh, fertilized as a last frontier for Egyptian capitalism. This was a loyal opposition, basically. Someone was allowed to be in opposition, officially illegal, so they would channel and uh, kind of, kind of uh, attract all opposition voices, but who would not break with the system essentially once they took power. And this was exactly the role that they played, to save the system. However, they could not feed uh, the Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian uh, masses. You know, one, some, some guy told me, you know, uh, Muslims can fast for a month, but they can't fast for a year. And that's exactly the truth. You, know, you can sell so much, uh, you know, by telling people that, you know, bow your head, and then in the next world you, you'll be better. You know, do your work, accept what's coming to you. Uh, in the end, the, what, what Morsi couldn't do, that he could not feed, he could not clothe, he could not give people in Egypt housing, electricity, uh, stability, or any kind, any sense that there was actually a future to be built. He basically continued the same as before. And that's why we saw 17 million people coming out in the second revolution against Morsi, uh, which was on a far higher level, but essentially it did the same thing. It made the same mistake of just bringing back another uh, faction of the ruling class. Um, and that's why, I mean, we can discuss about the Arab Revolution uh, a lot more, but obviously that's not the main uh, focus of this uh, thing. But just to say that, uh, that obviously after years, after several years of mo constant mobilizations and struggles, you saw an ebb in the movement, basically. Uh, the masses, I wouldn't say they, they were defeated in any way, because if you go to, to Egypt today, no one is tired of the, of the revolution, and no one would take anything, you know, from anyone really. They would not take, as they, especially the Egyptian workers, would not allow themselves to be dominated and oppressed the same way. Uh, and, and Sisi has not defeated them either. But people are saying, well, this is not working. You can't just go out on the streets, overthrow someone, have a general strike, have it, and then some similar person uh, would come up. Although I would say Morsi's. First uh, prime minister, oh, Sisi's first prime minister was also overthrown by a mass movement. Uh, although it wasn't like uh, as big as the other one. So I would say because of this situation, you had an ebb in the movement. Uh, people are a bit, uh, people are tired first of all. But people also want to, if they want to move, they want to move differently. They want to have something else. They want to shift things in a deeper, deeper way. And that would, that's something I think a lot of Arabs would, uh, would uh, are actually saying right now. Um, in Syria, the Syrian revolution developed uh, a, a bit differently because in Syria the situation was different from, uh, from Egypt, for instance, which has had a long period with privatizations, liber liberalizations, and you know, basically the, the state and the ruling class had, had a lot, had no legitimacy left. But in Syria the situation was different because in Syria in the 60s, in the late 60s, through different uh, because of uh, peculiar situations, there was a revolution which was led by basically the armed, like an officer caste. And uh, through a peculiar situation, they ended up nationalizing the whole economy, basically expropriating uh, the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, and, um, and implementing something modeled on the Soviet Union, a deformed worker state, we could say, where there's no democracy, complete lack of uh, all of this. But because of the ca ca planned economy, they were able to raise living standards, you know, relatively compared to the rest of the region to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, give people more stability in their lives. The, the cultural level was higher, there was no real unemployment. And although uh, Bashar al-Assad had tried to take back these gains, uh, since the 90s, you know, it's been opening up and there's been talk about the Chinese model, which is basically going towards capitalism. This has not been implemented in full force, and especially in the cities, there was still a level of stability amongst the working class. And I would say, uh, once the, the, when the revolution started, it started in the east, uh, which was the places mostly hit by privatizations. Uh, you know, where there was a drought and there was a million people being uh, displaced. And obviously a lot of people were angry, but Bashar was intelligent enough to keep the city people and the, and the workers you know, more or less uh, happy, uh, although they weren't happy with the lack of democracy, obviously. 
But once the revolution started, you saw, uh, you saw it immediately picking up in the, well, it, it, it didn't pick up in the beginning, but once it picked up, it was mainly in the East. And, uh, <coughs> and um, but it struggled to gain a foothold within, within the, the cities and the, and the working class. In fact, there was no real strikes in Egypt taking place. The strikes that were before it were strikes of merchants, so basically, you know, middle class uh, strikes, but no real worker strikes as such during the revolution. Because a lot of Assyrian workers were saying, well, you know, you want democracy, you want U.S. intervention, you, know, you want them to implement democracy. What kind of democracy is the U.S. going to bring up? Democracy like in Iraq? Democracy like in Afghanistan? Or at best, like democracy like they have in, in, in Turkey? Which is no uh, real uh, democracy. So I think a, a lot of people, and at the same time, with the, with the cost of what? Privatizations, unemployment, all of these things that they know were, were, were going to happen. And people were not interested, not that they weren't sympathetic to the democratic ideas, but I think a lot of workers were just, uh, did not want to support uh, any side. Um, and that meant that the, that the revolution stalled to a halt. And in fact, be, uh, you know, the, the program in a, in a revolution is the most important thing, because obviously a revolution, uh, Marxists were not pacifists, but a revolution is uh, always weaker than the state when it comes to armed uh, armed conflict. Uh, obviously, the, the, you, know, you don't have a general staff, you don't have you know, educated people in, ta in the tactics of, of war, you don't have like military exercises which has consolidated the workings of the army for, for years and years, you don't have modern equipment, at, le at best you have like semi, you know, a bit more than lightweight guns and so on. So obviously you're in a much weaker p uh, position, it, but that's not the point. In a revolutionary situation, the program is the, is the best weapon, and the armed uh, struggle is only auxiliary. Like, uh, during the Russian Revolution, 21 armies attacked the Bolsheviks, who had uh, literally uh, one gun per two soldiers. So once the first one died, then the second one would continue fighting. But how did they win the civil war? It was by going to the, to the soldiers on the other side and saying, we're your brothers and sisters, we don't want uh, to fight against you. Put, turn your arms against your own uh, ruling classes and we'll help you and we'll build a socialist federation, a world socialist federation where, where, where there's no struggle between, uh, between the nations. And that's how they won uh, in, in extremely backward conditions with, with very uh, with a high level of isolation. Um, and that's how they won the, the civil war basically. But the Syrian revolution did not do that. And by not doing this, it's ground to a halt. And then as tiring started setting in, obviously with the, with the military part of the, uh, the revolution gaining the upper hand, then it was also easier for reactionary forces like the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks, the Jordanis, and the Americans to get a foothold in, you know, because people are fighting, they're dying. So it's quite easy to say, well, we got some guns, you need, you need arms, uh, you can have it. They're in a desperate situation, <laughs> you have to do this and this and this. And that meant that they could put in a, a, a you know, they, they could gain a foothold and started pushing the revolution towards, uh, not away from a class position, and towards a sectarian position. The revolution started <coughs> with calling, we're all Syrians, and ended by calling, uh, uh, today, where, where do you hear that? Not all Syrians, it's all about, uh, you know, Allah Akbar, or this or that or other religious uh, thing. Not that we're against uh, <laughs> religion per se, but the, but, but, but the point is that they, they, they moved it away, Divided up, uh, divided up uh, Syrian society and pushed it on a nationalist or a sectarian uh, character. And that did not weaken Assad in, in any way whatsoever. In fact, that strengthened Assad. Because democracy was something that people in, in, in the Western Syria could relate to. If it was, if it was, uh, if it would combine with the social demands of nationalization, of uh, workers' control, workers' democracy, they could have been a foothold. But by putting it up uh, towards a sectarian uh, uh, civil war, then, uh, then what would a Christian think you know, in, in that situation? No Christian or Alawite would, would see themselves as safe. And in fact, the, I would say the, uh, the, the, true, the proof of this was shown uh, in May or June when, the, when there was elections, so-called elections in Syria. Obviously, it's sham elections. There's no real opposition allowed to stand. But there was mass participation. Uh, in, in Lebanon, there was 100,000 people going to the Syrian uh, embassy to vote. This doesn't show that people are, uh, people are in favor of Assad, 
to show that they would not have the barbarism and the, 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 the situation that they see. In, in, they would rather have extreme oppression than that. And then that the whole, all of society and the culture, culture basically falling together and uh, barbarism uh, prevailing. Um, and that was pushed by who? By, uh, <coughs> by, uh, by, 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 the, by the US imperialism and their allies in the Gulf states, in Turkey and in Jordan. The most reactionary forces on this planet were behind, the, behind that thing. And you know, uh, it's funny because they, they talk today, it's like, oh, they talk about the barbarism of ISIS and you know, all the decapitation. As long as they were decapitating Syrians, they, was, they were freedom fighters, you know, in the media, they were potatoes, revolutionary freedom fighters, fighting against oppression, fighting against all of this. But, uh, but, but today, suddenly, because now they got out of control, they become a threat to themselves. And billions of, of dollars were funded into, into the sectarianism. And, you know, some people say, well, the U.S. didn't support ISIS directly, although I have my doubts about that. But it doesn't matter, because by whipping up the sectarianism, by putting it in that... That is the logical conclusion. All other groups were, first of all, supported and funded by, by the Americans and, and the CIA, as well as probably ISIS, and their, all their allies. You know, who, they, were, they were trained in Jordan and Turkey, and some of them in, in Qatar, and all of them got funds, logistical help, all kinds of support from this. Why? In order to cut through the Arab Revolution, and in order to, basically because of their own games in the region, against, you know, because they had their own internal contradiction, uh, competition with, with Iran and with Syria and, and, and so on. Um, and again, although the hypocrisy didn't end there, because then they, you know, they didn't really, weren't really prepared to do anything, you know, then they started bombing. But they weren't really prepared to do anything once uh, ISIS attacked the Kobane. You know, you had this situation a, a few weeks ago developing with these desperate people, actually the Kurds being the only people who had fought against ISIS successfully. Why? Because they were defending something that, that they believed in. They were defending a democratic system, which was non-sectarian, anyone could participate, and it was far more progressive than anything else in the, in, in, in the region. And that's why they, they would fight till the end. You know, that's why the, the Maliki's army in Iraq didn't, didn't want to fight, because they didn't have anything to defend. But these people were defending their own homes. And what did the imperialists do? The, the Turks cut the border, not allowing uh, the PKK uh, to send in troops to help, not allowing anyone to send arms or money or anything else. Although they kept the channel open to send supplies to ISIS from, uh, from, from Turkey. They allowed ISIS to recruit from, from Turkey. The Americans, you know, obviously they were, they, were not, they were against ISIS officially, but they weren't really hitting anything. I, I read some reports saying, well, you know, they're bombing, but they're not hitting the tanks and the heavy artillery that they have there. Uh, so they basically bled them out, and now they're, they're letting the Peshmerga in, which is supposedly, uh, you know, a progressive Iraqi uh, force. But the Peshmerga is a, a far right-wing, feudal wing of the Kurdish movement. And the Peshmerga have been trying to crush the, the Syrian part of, the, of Kurdistan for, for ever since they gained autonomy a few years ago. But they haven't been allowed to because people were against them, first of all. And the PKK has said, well, you know, you can participate in our democratic structures, but you're not allowed to carry arms. Well, now that's finished, because now they need their help. And, and it's basically, I would say, it's, an, it's the beginning of an invasion of Syrian Kurdistan by the Iraqi, I, I, Iraqi Kurds. So that's the whole, uh, again, the whole hypocrisy of U.S. imperialism has been, um, and the so-called coalition has been completely uh, exposed. And in fact, the, 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 the imperialists and the, and the Islamists have no uh, different, you know, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. In fact, the, the, the Islamic fundamentalists could not have survived a single day with billions of dollars being channeled into them by the imperialists and their allies in, 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 in the region. Um, um, yes, and, it's, and, and I think everybody is beginning to see this. I think a lot of normal people are just don't know what to do anymore, I cannot believe anything. Um, then there's the question of, of, of Iraq, you know, Barack Obama was very sentimental when he declared oh, we must fight, fight barbarism in Iraq and so on. I, I would say that how many people, how many people have ISIS uh, killed? Let's say they killed 10,000 people. Let's, kill, let's say they killed 50,000 people. How many hundreds of thousands of people were not killed by the US occupation uh, of, 
Iraq. That's barbarism. I mean, that was, and that was directly. And then what did the, the Americans do? They attacked the power grid, the water supply, the, the, you know, all the basic functionings of society was completely destroyed by, by the Americans. Millions of people have, in fact, been killed be, because of the, 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 the American occupation and, and the, well, now the three wars that they fought against, uh, against the country. That's barbarism. And in fact, the, the, you know, the whole Iraq, you know, you can say a lot of things about Saddam Hussein, and we're not dependent on Saddam. Saddam was a brutal dictator, but there was no sectarianism as such in Iraq at, at that time. Saddam was, a, he oppressed uh, certain parts of the country, <coughs> especially the Shia part, and he also oppressed the Kurds. And that's, uh, that was, uh, obviously, we're, we're completely against that. But, but still, there was not sectarianism as a, like a cultural phenomenon amongst the uh, the majority as, a, as a, like a dominating trend within Iraq. That was again introduced by who? By the Americans. Why? Because after the, the occupation, there was, there was a, there were, they, they not only took down Saddam, they also took, took out his whole state apparatus. So in order to dominate the country, in order to, to, to oppress the, the revolutionary resistance movement that in fact started, they had to re lean on different sectarian elements of Shia uh, sectarians, of Sunni sectarians, and every attempt they, they made, uh, the Iraqis made to, to form cross-sectarian movements, and there were several attempts. Not necessarily the leftist one, even bourgeois ones. Every, every attempt they, they made was uh, sabotaged by, by the Americans and the Stooges in, in, in Baghdad. Um, and Maliki that they put in, you know, suddenly Maliki is not very popular with the Americans. He was a gangster, he's always been a gangster. I mean, he's just a thug, you know, he's just like some guy you find off the streets and give him a suit. And that's exactly what he is. And the way that he ruled Iraq was not through uh, any kind of, you know, democracy, democracy, you know, <coughs> like George Bush used to say, but just through uh, horror. And also, I mean, he used sectarianism not even because I would say he's probably not even a, a Shia, like a, like a you know, practicing Shia, but just because it's, it's an easier way to do it. Well, you, someone owes him money in a Sunni part of, it, uh, part of the country. He releases some Shia uh, gang to go and ravage the whole country, uh, the whole area, rape some people, and kill whoever is the opponent of Maliki. That was that was the type of uh, uh, rule that Maliki introduced. You know, um, uh, at one stage when he felt threatened by cross sectarian currents, he whipped up Shia sectarianism. He he even sentenced his a vice president to, uh, to death. I mean, that's, uh, that's the kind of people that the Americans put, put in there. And suddenly, because everybody can see this now and they're really embarrassed, they have to distance themselves from him. But that's uh, the guy they put in. And I would say that uh, Maliki was a compromise between the Americans and their enemy, the Iranians. And I would say the reason why they put him there was because he was probably the most corrupt person they, they could find. Because they could, they, then they could bribe him, you know, and they could work with him, and they could find a deal about anything. And that, and that, that is uh, the, the, how the U.S. Uh, how the U.S. Uh, ruled uh, Iraq by sectarianism, you know, by all making all the state in institutions in Iraq being sectarian based. You know, uh, the president has to be a Kurd, the prime minister has to be a, a Shia, the the speaker of parliament has no power basically. It has to be a Sunni. And all institutions, all political development were pushed into these modes. It's completely foreign to the, to the Arabs. I mean, the Arab world is one nation, I mean, really speaking. Stretching from, uh, I mean, there are differences, but stretching from Iraq to Morocco is, is, is the same uh, as one nation with, with different dialects, we can say, or with different, you know, regional peculiarities. But, but the Americans and imperialism will, throughout the, the last hundred years, try to split this uh, thing up and whip up this... Uh, this uh, sectarianism in order to rule and dominate the, 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 the region. Um, and also, what's the, what's the social situation that they created in, in, in Iraq? Unemployment, I mean, you have, this is the case in, throughout the Middle East, but especially, I would say, probably in Iraq more than anywhere, you have this layer of the youth which have nothing to look forward to, you know, which are unemployed and cannot really hope for any kind of employment, which just wanders from one a <coughs> street corner to another, living in absolute desperation, and uh, it's basically you know cigarettes and tea. That's that's all the, the life is up. You know your breakfast is cigarettes and tea. Your lunch is breakfast cigarettes. Am I right? Am I right? I mean, you, if if anyone here lives in the region, they would know. And there's this this completely 
dispossessed, declassed youth who have nothing to look forward to. And this is the layer that, that uh, joins ISIS. Why? Because some, finally they think that there's something to fight for. Obviously the, the majority of this layer also fights for, for, for the revolution. Um, but some of them join these kinds of, uh, kinds of outfits. Um, uh, you know, housing in Iraq, there's this desperate need for a million new uh, houses or flats. But there's only 25,000 being uh, built uh, per year. Water, electricity, all of these things work you know, far below half of capacity, mainly because the Americans destroyed the whole of the infrastructure. 22% of children, uh, growth is, is stunted because of uh, chronic uh, malnutrition. Uh, that's, that's the situation that, that, they, that they created it. And once the Arab Revolution broke out, there was also movements in Iraq. How did Maliki, and that was during, that was when the occupation was still going on, at least uh, for, the, you know, for a couple of months. How did Maliki uh, act against the democratic, peaceful uh, demonstrators? By shooting them down, by, by arresting them, by illegalizing them, by oppressing them. That's, that's, the, that's what American imperialism means in, 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 the, in the Middle East. Uh, however, over a period, the, 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 I would say that the Arab Revolution, there was like, it was simmering. The movements did not, were not completely suppressed in Iraq, and there was a simmering revolt throughout uh, 2011, 12, and 13. Uh, finally, in the, in the end of 2013, there was huge movement, especially in the Anbar province. Although this movement originally was uh, throughout Iraq, but mainly in the Sunni, uh, Sunni areas. And you had, uh, in Fallujah, I think it was uh, 100,000 people camping for two months uh, in, the, in the city squares, uh, basically occupying the city center. And what kind of a movement was this? I remember there was a lot of talk about uh, you know, these, the Saudis and Qatar, you know, the Gulf states, basically giving money to a lot of tribal leaders to bring food to the movement, to kind of bribe them, basically. And there was a lot of discussion about this, but there was one guy I read an interview with, and he said, he was saying some interesting things. He said, look, everyone wants to get a foot inside, but we have nothing to do with any of them. All the politicians, all the rulers, the whole establishment, they're all corrupt. And uh, we're, not, we're not sectarian based. What we want is, is uh, what was it, jobs and, uh, and fight against inflation, inflation and an end of corruption. That was the real, uh, the, the real movement. How did Maliki react to this? He bombed Fallujah for two months. I mean, this is, what, what, what else can you get? You know, oh, he said, oh, well, Al-Qaeda is operating. Probably Al-Qaeda had a few, few, few hundred people there. But they didn't have any foothold within the hundreds of thousands of people uh, fighting. But I would say after that, probably a lot of people just say, well, what's the difference? You know, what's the difference be between being bombed indiscriminately? A city of half a million people being bombed indiscriminately for weeks uh, and then having Al-Qaeda ruling, whatever that could bring. There's no difference. It was hell. It was hell on earth. And I would say that was, uh, that was when the, the situation changed. And the anger towards the Iraqi army especially, which is a mainly Shia-dominated army, and seen as an occupying force, the anger burst to the fore, uh, and they were pushed out a lot of places. They could not hold the whole of the western, the Anbar province, basically. They, they fizzled out, and they had to withdraw. Uh, and that's also the, 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 the basis of the whole situation in Mosul, where you had an uprising, clearly led by, uh, I mean, the, the, the probably the strongest force, although not the majority, I would say, of this uh, uprising was uh, formed by ISIS uh, people and other Islamist organizations, other tribal based, other like nationalist, ex baathist movements and so on, uh, who stepped into this vacuum of, of the state basically withdrawing. Um, the, yeah, they, they had a few hundred people uh, rising up, but I think also the, the, the reasons for why the army in Mosul, the 30,000 strong, is a, a lot more than 800 people, the reason why they withdrew was because they were afraid of what the people would say people who just had enough of this. Uh, and, um, and basically, well, there, was a, there was an element of an uprising in, the, in that thing. And also, what, would, what did the, the Iraqi soldiers have to defend? I mean, they weren't fed, they weren't clothed, they were, the arms were out of, uh, out of date. What did they have to, and they, they had to defend Maliki and that corrupt government, which no one believes in. Obviously, they had no, nothing to fight for, and, and, and they disappeared. And that is the situation. That is the beginning of the situation you had in Iraq where this, I say, you know, like basically a wild west developing, an area which, which no one really controls, 
Uh, and, and all of this, in my opinion, could, and, uh, could be traced back to the interventions of imperialism and the West in the whole of the, uh, whole of the region. Um, da -da -da. And also, I would say, uh, uh, during the Iraq war, they, they overthrew, the, you know, they, they dismantled the Iraqi state and also the Iraqi army, which meant that the, the, the other large army in the region, the Iranian army, was left completely untouched, unchecked. Sorry. And that changed the whole balance of forces in the region between the different nations. And you had the Saudis and the Gulf states feeling extremely threatened because they're basically hanging by a thread, having no legitimacy, nothing to justify the, the corrupt rule of a kingdom, you know, uh, basically defending Mecca, which is like a Muslim thing, and why can it, why it have kings, obviously, it doesn't really <laughs> fit together. An extremely corrupt and rot, particularly rotten clique, and they were very afraid of what could happen because they could not, if, if, if the Iranian army was allowed to basically rule. So that's why they started the, the, the you know, um, stepping up the proxy wars, the arming different proxy group of all kinds of uh, Islamists mainly, who are also a threat to themselves actually, even if they come back to Saudi Arabia, but rather have them abroad than, than at home. Um, and again, whipping up the sectarian side of, uh, side of the, the, the the equation. Um, so, and also, well, just to, just to end, I would say this is uh, the, the situation is clear. Uh, this whole this whole mess is caused by capitalism, by imperialism. And what, what the, the U.S. intervention today, the, the Western intervention, is not going to solve anything because what are they building in Syria? They're building the moderate forces. Who are the moderate forces? You know, now they talk about Jabhat al-Nusra as a moderate force. They, they wanted to fuse, they were going to fuse with ISIS uh, one year ago, a year and a half ago. So how can, you know, what's, what does that mean, moderate force? Uh, there's a, what is it, the <coughs> Hazm, is it? Harakat, what is it? Harakat al-Zaman al-Muhammad, right? Which means uh, the movement of the Muhammad, uh, the time of Muhammad. Is that a, is that a non-sectarian? Basically, you want to rule Iraq, uh, Syria, sorry, you want to dominate Syria by whipping up more sectarianism, but just sectarianists that they can control more, basically, you know? Islamists that don't really follow through to what, what, what they decided and who, who they can deal with. And in Iran, they, the only thing, that, in Iraq, the only thing they had to lean on is the, is the Shia militias, and who are completely backed by, by Iran, which is now de facto the closest ally in the region. But what are the Shia militias do? I saw this interview with some of them, uh, and they said, oh, look, they showed you know, some, in some journalists, oh, there's like a body of nine ISIS men hanging from a tree. And then they visited the, the village from where they, these bodies came from, and they interviewed people. They said, well, they're not ISIS people. They attacked, the ISIS guys fled, and they didn't have anything to go back and show their, their own. So they just kidnapped some random people and killed them. Just more sectarianism. And that is what American imperialism is basing itself on. So that's obviously not going to solve anything. And also now they want to split up the Iraqi army into regional armies. So basically giving every governor his own army. Which is just a, a recipe for even more disaster fragmentation. And it's not going to solve anything. Uh, sectarianism has always been completely tied up to imperialists. Who started off, the, I mean, it goes back to the First World War where the Middle East, the Arab nation, which is, as I said, one nation, essentially, was split up and completely artificially you see these straight lines, you know, between Iraq and Syria. Egypt is the only country in the world which has a bottom left corner, you know. Completely artificial, uh, completely artificial lines. And they were designed to what? To, to, to get different groups of uh, nationalities and sects and so on in, to play them up, to whip them up, play them out against each other, in order to dominate the situation. Now, although in a deep crisis of capitalism on a world scale, this is blowing up in the, in the faces of imperialism, and it's blowing up to an uncontrollable level that they cannot control. You know, the, yeah, so that they cannot uh, tolerate. They have to do something, but uh, again, everything they do, just, uh, it just makes the situation worse. Capitalism cannot solve this situation in, in, in the Middle East. And I think it's quite clear from, from what I tried to explain, that you have the crisis of capitalism, but it's, 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 uh, it's not just you know, you see, it's, it's producing two different trends. On the one hand, you have the barbarism, the bloodbath, the decay, the backwardness, uh, 
these uh, that these animals really is, uh, um, represent in Iraq and Syria. And on the other hand, you have the the the, the, the Arab Revolution, which in it rep carries the, the the germ of socialism, which is not you know a, a, a specific idea, but it's but it's you know like the, an ideology put into the minds of the masses. But it's just the acknowledgement of the fact that in this region there are the, the natural resources, the human resources, and the demand, uh, and, and all the possibilities to solve all the main problems of housing, of poverty, of malnutrition, of hunger, all of this. Everything is there. There's plenty of, of resources, but it's not been put together because the bourgeoisie, the imperialists, do not, cannot profit from it individually. Uh, so the only way to solve all these problems is for the, for the masses of the Middle East to take power in their own hands. And the Arab revolutions, in my opinion, is a first step towards that, although it's still in an unconscious uh, phase, we can see. And this whole question of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, you see, I would say that it has nothing to do with the masses of, 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 of the Middle East, who are traditionally uh, Islamic uh, people, Muslims. It has nothing to do with them, and in fact, it has never survived a single day without the active support of, of, of imperialism. It was built by them, firstly in the, 90, in the 50s against Nasser in, 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 um, in Egypt, in Afghanistan against the Soviets, against the Afghan revolution, uh, and, and now we see in Iraq and Syria, it's in a similar way, they, they built it up as a bulwark against revolution, against the will of the masses, against communism, against socialism, which is in fact the real traditions of, of the Middle East. If you go back, the only mass movements that have actually been, and the first mass movements to arrive in, in the Middle East were always either communist, left-wing nationalist, socialist, or some, so some kind of a leftist uh, movement. You had Nasser in, in, in Egypt, who was a very peculiar, contradictive figure, but he had left-wing leanings, he wanted to nationalize the whole economy. In Syria, we had the same situation. The Iraqi Communist Party had millions of members. In Sudan, uh, you had the same situation. Lebanese Communist Party, the Iranian Communist Party, the Turkish Communist Party, and the national movements that were also present in all these countries were very, very left-wing. Talked about nationalizations, talked about uh, a fight against imperialism, and, and so on. The fight against imperialism that the, that the Islamists talk about is completely hollow. Has, uh, it has its, its only words. It carries nothing. But the real tradition that the, that the Arab masses have and the Middle Eastern masses have is the socialism, is the traditions of socialism. And I would say in the next period, we will see the, the revival of these things because the masses are looking for a way out. And I would say probably in, a, in Syria and Iraq, the, the, the perspective has been postponed for a period, but there's big developments being, developed, being prepared in Egypt when nothing is solved, in, in Iran, where there's, uh, where there's big contradictions just waiting to explode. There was a big movement in 2009, but it was, it was kind of quelled down, but not crushed. And in Turkey, where we've seen the first explosions during the Gezi Park demos, but Turkish society is on, is on the edge of an explosion, I would say. It's, it's ripe for revolution. Uh, and that would, again, completely uh, change the situation in, in, in the rest of the, of the, of, of, of the region. Thank you very much.